I am Daniel Lukies and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years and today I have my two special guests. This is my first time that I have two special guest people. They are husband and wife, team behind Book One of the Good Posture Chronicles, a supernatural tale about breaking generational curses to forge a new bonds of hope called Caretaker with the pen name R.J. Halbert. Please do welcome Mr. and Miss Halbert. Thank you so Thank much you. for having us. This is really exciting to get to have our book out in the world and get to talk about it. Yes, and congratulations for being Amazon bestseller for your debut book. It's absolutely wild to even hear you say that. Uh, I don't think we expected it, but here we are, and we are so thankful. It's It's been widely supported. Thank you for sharing your talents with the world. So, Mr. Jason, how does it feel that you won Emmy and Grammy Award? Uh, it's been a very exciting career. Um, I never dreamed I could make a living in music, yet alone um, eventually in television. Um, I've been uh, a musician for 30 plus years, and for the last 20, I've been the music director for Kelly Clarkson, and I've had a wonderful career traveling around the world with her and producing um, songs in her albums and co-writing. And uh, thanks to Kelly, um, we've had the privilege of bringing my family on the road with us, uh, my wife and my children to travel. And then um, and then Kelly started a TV show about four years ago. We're finishing up our fifth season now. And um, it's always exciting to be honored for, for the work. So it was very exciting to win uh, a Grammy for vocal production for Kelly and as well as an Emmy for being a producer on the show. Congratulations again. You are a versatile, multi-talented. So what's the difference of being an author and composer for a song? It's, um, it's, it's quite different. I was um, really surprised. Um, it, it's exciting to be able to tell a much longer story. You know, typically in a song, you have about three minutes to convey a story. And uh, the story is mostly told through verses. And I never dreamed of being an author. Um, it was actually Rhonda who made this happen and pushed it forward. I had some ideas for stories, but um, she took the ideas and really brought them to life. And um, and it's been so exciting being on, a, on a, an adventure with my wife and this new journey of telling stories through the medium of books rather than music. So do you think women are the good luck for men? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Rhonda, what inspired you to become an author? Uh, I don't know that I actually wanted to become an author um, because I am actually dyslexic and reading and writing was always a struggle for me as a kid. And uh, it got better as I got older, but it was still a struggle. Um, but I think what kind of threw us into the place of becoming authors is we just had a really fantastical supernatural story that we wanted to tell. And it felt kind of daunting to even try to turn it into a book. Um, at first we talked to each other about, Oh, maybe we should make a movie or maybe we should do a television series. And, and then um, a friend of ours recommended, Oh, you should probably do a book first because then you could take that to any, any platform that you wanted. And that was actually really scary for me. Um, but I do love a challenge. So <laughs> yes. um, I don't like saying no. I like to step into something and see if I can do it before I say no. And it's okay if I fail, um, but I'm at least going to try. So I kind of threw myself into the position of being an author. Yes. I think if you failed, <laughs> failure, mm -hmm. failure make you perfect, as they said. Yes. So, Miss, what will be your hope for caretaker? I would love, uh, maybe this is a small dream, but I would love to see it completed in the original idea of it being a trilogy. So the caretaker is book one 
of um, a trilogy. And so I would love to see the whole story be able to come out. Um, I think I would love to see it developed into a TV series, which that's where Jason's creativity comes in. When, when he contributed his portion of writing this book, he definitely could see the TV series and he was writing from that perspective. And so that would be, that would be a huge dream um, that I would love to see happen for this whole entire series. So how do you collaborate in writing this book? So you will do the part one. I'll do the part chapter two and stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, been, it's been fun to collaborate. It sort of happened naturally. Um, uh, I started dreaming some ideas out loud um, to Rhonda. We've, we've had some incredible experiences over the years, um, traveling and, and different homes we've lived in. And um, if, if we were like any couple I can imagine, it's like the X-Files. There's Mulder and Scully. And uh, but we're kind of reversed in roles. Rhonda is always in tune with the supernatural and the spiritual. And uh, actually, some of those elements kind of scare me. And so I'm always looking for the scientific basis to what could actually be happening. And um, so when we collaborated, we created this world and it was fun to be able to tell it from two points of view in a way, um, you know, the, in, in the book, many different things are happening and. And you're not sure, is this real? Is this in their minds? Is this natural? Is this supernatural? What's happening? So Ron and I basically combined our two worldviews together. And um, a lot of it happened with her recording voice memos and me talking and dreaming, recounting stories from our past. And then um, she would turn those into, into words and put it to paper. And then we would go back and forth. Wow. Interesting, Mr. Jenner. Is there a chapter in the book where... Uh, based on your experience, yeah, I think almost every almost every scene in the book is based on some nugget of reality. There was a seed of something that happened in our life. Um, one of the ones, you know, we um, even the story of bees in the wall, or hearing whispers in rooms, or weird things happening on intercoms. Um, the, all those things were based in some sort of. Um, real life situation. I remember uh, Rhonda, we were working on a home in California and she heard some whispers behind her and that stuff scares me to death and she loves it and gets excited about it. So we sort of incorporated those things into the book to sort of figure out, you know, where or how are these things happening? Two heads better than one, as they said. <laughs> <laughs> so what challenges have you faced when you're writing Caretaker? Um, I think, like I said before, I'm dyslexic. So that was probably the biggest challenge for me. Um, it just was such a struggle. It's a, it's a, a memory issue for me and a writing issue. Um, and so I just had to really push through and thankfully I've got to say, I've, I had several pe people around me who became my cheerleaders and they were cheering me on. You can do this, Rhonda, you can do this. And and there were times that I would have to put it down and give myself some space and then be able to come back to it. Um, but yeah, I would say because dyslexia, you know, directly affects reading and writing specifically, that would, that would have probably have been my biggest challenge. Very well said, Ms. Rhonda. How about you, Mr. Jason? What are your challenges? Um, I think it was interesting. It was a challenge to tell a story and, and because from the very beginning, we know where the story is going and we don't want to give away too much. And so to sort of divide it and find a good storytelling arc that can lay the groundwork for where we're going in the book, keep the readers interested without giving too much away um, in life in general. I love spoilers and I, I want to give everything away. So to slow down the pace and, and really, again, you know, in music, you can tell a story in three minutes. And so now to tell a story over three books and to slow down that pace was a huge challenge for me. I love spoilers too. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you handle writer's block when you're writing a well, caretaker? <laughs> um, I had some interesting ways of, of <laughs> helping cure that. Um, but probably the, the best one that worked for me was actually going on walks. Um, walking is actually very good for your brain. 
it is a process of cleansing your brain. The motion of your arms moving back and forth and your legs moving back and forth is an action that causes a cleansing of toxins in your brain. And so for me, I would do several walks, probably two walks a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, um, just to get away from the computer, to get away from my uh, stresses and just clear my head. And at the time we were living in California and the scenery there is just so beautiful. It's peaceful. Uh, the temperatures are perfect, you know. Um, so for me, it was a nice calming way for me to get myself out of that. And then, you know, to be honest, I couldn't write every day. There were some days that I had to skip or maybe even a week that I would have to skip. Um, I, I believe that if you're going to have true creativity, you have to treat your brain to be relaxed and to be receptive um, and to be calm because it's got to have a bump free zone to come out through, if that makes any sense. Like you don't want any speed bumps to slow you down. So I really worked on just keeping myself calm, keeping my brain calm, doing some exercise. And it actually worked for me. Very well said. For me, I think, um... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And for me, a way to get over writer's block um, was just a change of scenery. I found it hard to um, work all the time from home or at work. And so there were several times where we just got away for a week to a new location, um, in a new environment and the different new sights and sounds and smells just really unlock the brain again. And, uh, so that was one way that we could get over, over hurdles and moving. The but before we go on, uh, we, I want to shout out my listeners in Japan. Arigato Saimas to Japan for supporting this podcast because I got a uh, 54% audience share in Tokyo. Aishi at 28%. Miyazaki at 3%. Gufu Nara Wakayama. Yogo Kumamoto Kanagawa and a lot more. Again, Arigato Saimas Hi Japan for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers, authors all over the world like Mr. and Miss Halbert. So Arigato Saimas <laughs> Japan. So, what is your favorite book that influenced this caretaker? Uh, for me, for me, um, one of my favorite authors is actually a Canadian author, Neil Stevenson, and uh, he tells epic stories. Uh, it's historical fiction based. So, Neil Stevenson is definitely a huge influence, and then also J.J. Abrams has a book called S. Uh, that was a huge influence um, for me on the book. Um, I have a book series that I read over and over again. And one particular book in the series is called Rooms. And um, it's James L. Rubart is the author. And I just like the way that he writes mystery and suspense. And you're just not quite sure where he's going to go with his story. So um, I actually love to go back and read that quite often when I'm looking and, and thinking and dreaming up uh, new inspiration. Well done, both of you. So how do you approach the research process of Caretaker? Ooh, I think that's our favorite part of the entire process. So definitely for me, and, and we both research different areas. Um, our our book, um, the, the series takes place over thousands of years. Uh, the first book really focuses on one narrow area, but um, we had to research different cultures, different symbolism. Uh, every name in the book has been researched and every name has a special meaning. And um, even our locale, um, you know, Rhonda did a research trip into New England to go find the perfect town to base our book in. And I'll, I'll let her tell a little bit of that. Um, yeah, I just, we, we knew that we wanted the family to start off in Boston. Boston's a very special place for me and Jason. Um, so that felt like a good place for us to put the family at the beginning of the book, but we knew that they were going to leave looking for a new start. Um, so I, I wanted to find something that was within at least two to three hour drive from Boston. And so I went up into New Hampshire and found the cutest town, and it's called Littleton, New Hampshire. So that's where the basis of this book takes place, is in Littleton, New Hampshire. 
And if you ever get a chance to visit New Hampshire, either in the spring or in the fall, it is absolutely magical. And that town was just so darling. It's everything that you expect from a little town in America. And so I just felt like it was the perfect backdrop for what this family was about to uh, encounter. Yes, indeed. So you're planning this will be a trilogy or will be a series? The print version is definitely a trilogy, and we're hoping to take this at some point. It's our dream to take this to a, a streaming series of some sort, um, because we feel like that's the best medium to tell um, such a wide-ranging story. The, the story takes place in so many locations and over such a large period of time that we'd really like the time to tell tell the entire story visually as well. Perfectly. So can you come back to book one on review when it already adapted as a series or a movie? <laughs> well, please do come back and let's talk about it. <laughs> so, Absolutely, we will. Yes, across my fingers, it's something else, right? People, let's support these amazing fantasy novels. So what advice do you have for aspiring writers out there? Um, I, I think advice that I would give is if you feel you've got a story, um, and you're just afraid to approach the journey to get it out into paper form. Um, I think I, I feel like that's usually where authors get stuck is you've got the idea. How do you get it through that daunting task of getting it to book form? Um, for me and Jason, what really worked, uh, I think was probably voice memoing almost every thought we had. It allowed me to be able to save all of those thoughts. And then I could take my time and type them out so that I could see them out, you know, on my computer screen and save it on, you know, the digital paper. And it gave me the time to be able to work those things out. So like a, as a first time author, I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to work everything out. I had to take it step by step. But because I voice memoed all of our ideas, I didn't have to re go back into my mind and go, now, what did we say here? And what did we think about here? I had it all recorded. So I would just really advise anybody who's just got an idea, record yourself talking it out. Talking is also a form of processing and being able to work out your storyline and your characters. And, and I just found it to be so helpful. So that would be my advice. And I would piggyback off of that saying that after you verbally get your information out, um, I found it very freeing not to be bound on your next step by perfect grammar or the right words to say that the thoughts and the ideas are more important than the actual execution of it. And it's just free yourself from the burden of every word being precious your first time around. Just get your ideas down on paper. And then we would revisit the same sentence five different times later, and then we'd find the right words or the right pace to tell it. So I think it's just important just to actually start getting something down on paper and not worry about the final product while you're doing that. And that just frees your creativity. Very well said, both of you. So how did you balance your writing career? in your other aspects of your life? That's a great question. Now, how do we do it, Rhonda? <laughs> <laughs> Always busy. Well, it, was, uh, it was probably more of a struggle, I think, for Jason. His schedule is so crazy being on the Kelly Clarkson show, especially when they were in LA. Um, it took a lot more of his time, even just traveling to work and then traveling back. The traffic in LA was so bad, it would take him an hour to get there and an hour to get back. So his time was really crunched and, and super valuable. So for him, going back to voice memoing in his long car drives, he would just voice memo his thoughts. And then he would send that to me. And I think that that was the best way that he could do it. Um, for me, I work for myself. I'm an entertainment manager. So I work from home. So I could kind of shift my schedule if I get all of my work done first thing in the morning uh, with all my emails and contacts and all of that, then I could spend my afternoon um, working on the book. And then when Jason would come home at night, that's pretty much all we would talk about is the book and, you know, dreaming up more ideas. So I don't know if that necessarily answers your questions, but that's just kind of how we did it. 
And it's amazing when you, you know, this as a podcaster, Daniel, and as a producer is that when you're doing something that you love, it's magic how time multiplies itself. And uh, you can always find times to do the things you love. And so this was such an inspiring process for us that um, it, it was, it didn't feel like time management. It just felt like a joy. I couldn't wait to get back and continue working on this book. Very true. And I, I, I think that caretaker is your bonding time at that time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So what are the some themes or topics that you want to passionate about exploring in your writing? That's a really good question. Um, for this book, we really wanted to explore. And I, when I say explore, we actually don't have the answers. We didn't go into this book knowing what the answers would be. We wanted to explore the concept. Does our physical reality have an effect on our mental reality and our spiritual reality or the metaphysical and vice versa? Does the uh, emotional and the mental have an effect on our physical world? And we explored this as a question and we put our characters in these situations. And of course, we came up with complete fiction fantasy ways of that happening. But in the process, we've been doing a lot of research scientifically. Um, and there's a lot of research, um, very well done research that um, our thoughts and as Rhonda is passionate about the words that we use and the words we choose actually do have an impact on our reality. Um, you know, you can... Um, some people call it manifestation or some people call it the power of thought and word. Um, but there's good scientific evidence that the words that come out of our mouth can affect our reality. And that's a topic that we heavily explored in the book. And we're still researching and still seeking wisdom and knowledge as to how that can, how that can apply in our real lives. Looking forward for that, Mr. Jason. And how about you, Ms. Rhonda? Um, I, I would say that's definitely what I was passionate about um, exploring as well. For me, the best example that I can give is I think most of us have probably heard that you can speak to plants and speak positively to them and they will thrive and multiply and almost as if you've given them fertilizer. And then you could speak to a plant and you could, you know, be, you could yell at it, you could be hateful towards it, you could curse at it, whatever. And you could actually watch the plant start to die. And if our words can do that to plants, what can it do to us? And so it's a huge question for me. And I wanted to find out, can we affect our own lives by what we speak? If we speak positive into our future, does that give us positive outcomes? If we speak negative into our future, does that give us negative outcomes? And as we are personally exploring those things, um, that's sort of what we based our book off of. And we put our family and our characters into these um, scenarios to see, you know, how they develop and how they respond to it. Um, which takes me to the statement, because I know that just sounds really weird. They are written characters. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but as you uh, what Jason and I have found is that as you write characters, um, you th you think you're creating something. And what's really miraculous to me was we were actually watching these characters develop themselves to the point to where we'd go, oh, no, he wouldn't say that or no, that she wouldn't do that. Um, and it was just, it's bizarre because being first authors, we'd never experienced anything like that before. Um, but it actually happened. And so that's what I mean by we put these characters into scenarios and then tried to see what would happen, see how they would respond because these characters actually did sort of develop themselves. Yes. Very well said, both of you. So how do you handle feedback or criticism of your work? I personally don't mind criticism. I I would rather get a no than get no answer. I feel like I can handle good or bad. It's fine because everybody has their own opinion and opinions doesn't change who I am. Um, it doesn't change what I've created. Um, I appreciate insight. If I feel like it, it resonates with me, um, then I will take it into consideration and I might make some changes, which we did do that. We sent this book out to a few people who are already in the publishing industry that we highly respect. 
and we sent it out to them and asked for their thoughts. And we definitely got, you know, some pushback of going, oh, you should probably think about changing this. And so we did because it resonated with us. We also got some pushback where they were like, oh, we don't like, you know, what you did here. And Jason and I, if we, if it didn't resonate with us, we would both kind of stand our ground and go, okay, thanks for your opinion. But this is actually how we envision this to go. So I think we handle, or I particularly can only speak for myself. I think I handle criticism pretty well. I want to learn from people. Again, I'm a new first time author. I don't know everything. I don't want to pretend I know everything. I will take any and all advice and criticism that I can. How about you, Mr. Jason? How do you handle criticism? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm being quiet because I'm horrible at criticism. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm the thing one. Even in my career with Kelly, you know, I've, you know, you can have a number one song on the radio and have a million people love it. And I find that one comment of somebody that doesn't like it. Um, that said, I, I love constructive criticism. Um, if you can tell me something's not good or you just don't like it and you give me some feedback along with it, then like Rhonda said, if it resonates, I'm open to it. If it doesn't resonate, then I'm confident in what I did. It's the uh, the unnamed one-star review with no reason why that gets under my skin a little bit. But that's why uh, that's why I have a great partner and wife who can remind me to shake that off and that it's not important. <laughs> yes. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to let it go, Dan. Well, those a lot of people are graping. They are not happy of what the success of others. So what do you think the publishing industry is changing and what does it mean for authors? It's hard to say necessarily what's changing because it's a brand new industry to us. So we're coming from 30 years of the music industry and we do see some similarities and there's things in the music industry that we've watched change and some for the better and some for the worse. Um, so we're so new to publishing. Um, it's hard to say what is changing because we haven't been around long enough. We did decide to self-publish though, because coming from the songwriting and creative world, um, it's it seems like in the publishing world, it's hard to maintain healthy control of your content. So we wanted to self-publish so that we could be responsible for and stand by our own story um, without it being changed a lot, which I, I've heard from other authors tends to happen a lot. So um, just like in music, we would love to see um, more honor and favor be geared towards the artist um, rather than the publishing companies. But again, I'm hesitant to speak into this industry because we're still new to it and we're still learning. Yes. Ms. Rhonda? I, I, I would echo that. We just don't know enough yet, but we have, uh, as Jason has been quoted before many times, it feels like we're drinking from a fire hydrant of knowledge, wisdom, experience of the publishing world. So we are definitely uh, still learning. Sometimes it feels like we're in over our head, but we are enjoying the process. But yeah, we have heard that a lot of things have changed. And, and recently someone told us who's been working in the publishing world for a long time, they said that after COVID, it just absolutely changed drastically. And we just weren't in that space at that time. So we really haven't experienced that. Um, but like Jason said, like we want to be in a place where authors are honored for their art and for their creativity. And we want to make sure that they get paid their value and their weight. And that I think is us coming from the music side because we feel that so passionately in the music side that as an artist creates art, we want to make sure that musicians get paid, that artists get paid and that they get paid worth their weight. Um, so I think we're just carrying that same feeling and understanding over from the music world. Definitely people. So what is something you wish you had known when you first started writing Caretaker? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I don't know about the writing process. Maybe you have something, Rhonda, um, you know, in the, in, in the actual releasing process. Um, I wish I had known um, that you should only release one version at a time. We got excited and released four versions at a time. We did a paperback and a hardback and a deluxe copy and an ebook. And uh, we didn't realize that in the publishing world, all those titles compete against each other. 
Um, so that was something I wish I'd have known a little bit earlier on, and we um, we will definitely fix that for book two. So I think definitely. for me, what I wish I would have known, um, like Jason, it wasn't so much about the writing process. It's the, after the writing. It's such new territory um, that I just, we just didn't know what to expect. So when I'm writing the book and I'm dreaming up getting to the end and having an actual book in my hand. I can't wait for that moment. I'm so excited. The first day that book arrives in the mail, like Jason and I were just elated and I'm holding my own product and I'm just so proud. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the hard part for me is I only dreamt up to getting my own book. And I didn't dream beyond that. And so the beyond that has been the hardest part of figuring it out along the way. So I'm thankful that as we release book two, we're going to have a whole lot more experience behind us to maybe do it a little bit better. But I'm still proud of, you know, what we've released and how we've released it. Yes. Congratulations. Despite all those uh, things happened, you are one of the best Amazon best-selling authors to be considered. So how do you hope caretakers will be remembered or appreciated by the future generations? I hope that caretaker becomes a tool for people that, that they, they can always go back to it. When we wrote caretaker, we were in a dire place in our lives as a family. And we had experienced a lot of loss and a lot of grief. And, and to top all of that, it was like two years of losing about 15 people in our lives. It was a lot. And then to top all of that off, we lost our home in a flood. And we're in, we lost everything there. And we're in the process of having to rebuild all of that. That is sort of what drove us to escape into our fantasy world of caretaker. It gave us something else to focus on other than our grief and our pain. And as we did that, it actually gave us a place to find hope. And so what I would love to see for caretaker in the future is that it becomes a tool of hope that if people ever feel like their struggles are just too big or that they can't get out of the deep hole, that maybe they can go back to this safe place of caretaker, this, this fictional journey that they can dive back into and maybe once again, hear those whispers of hope. Yes. Well said, I can't add anything onto that. <laughs> <laughs> Say to yes to the commander. <laughs> Definitely. So <laughs> Miss Rhonda and Mr. Jason, can you please invite our listeners to support Caretaker and the books more to come? So yeah, we would just love the listeners to come on this journey with us. Um, you can find us at RJ Halbert, and we're just so thankful for everyone that's giving us a shot as first time authors and we hope you enjoy the story and if you do please leave us a message and uh, give us some positive feedback and if you have a little bit of criticism i promise my skin will be a little bit thicker <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Rhonda? oh i think jason summed it up like you can you can find us on rjhalbert.com you can find us on all social medias RJ Halbert. Um, Thank you for letting us on your podcast. We will absolutely um, share with our followers as well to come and listen and join in on your podcast journey as well. Because if you continue to promote books and authors, we want to support that as well. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank and we would love to tell your listeners that we have an exciting audiobook coming out um, in early October. We've found an amazing cast of actors that are going to voice act all the characters. We have an incredible music score. Um, that's going to be underneath it. And if you want to join us in that journey, we have some really exciting ways you can be a part of it. You can go over to Kickstarter and search Caretaker and sign up for our email list. And you'll be the first to hear information about the audiobook that's coming out that we're very excited about. Wow. Looking forward for that. For Do you think for us releasing for the second book, it goes together with the audiobook? 
Yes, the audiobook is, is is for the first book, and um, it's going to set the tone and uh, and really set. It's going to be a fully immersive experience that's going to get readers ready for book two. That be awesome. As I said, looking forward to it, and good luck. I hope will be the next uh, caretaker in Netflix or whatever Amazon or any platform that we can see live action. So, Miss Rhonda and Mr. Jason, thank you for your time. Thank you so much thank for your so honor much. to be here. We appreciate yes. it.